Hi, my name is Dr. Monica Gandhi, and I'm going to give for World Med School an update on COVID-19 in August 2024. So um, if we start from the beginning of COVID-19, we have to actually go a little bit into the history because we are in an age of pandemic potential. This is really because new infections are entering humans because of global warming, interaction with animals and our disturbing interaction with animals and encroaching on their habitats. Changes in agriculture can also bring new pests and pathogens into connections with humans. Urbanization means that infections spread quickly around the world and the breakdown of public health measures, poverty, war, famine, all of this can lead to being at the beginning of an era of pandemics. So what happened with COVID-19? Well, actually, there are now seven vir coronaviruses, including the one that causes COVID-19, which is SARS-CoV-2, which infect humans. There are four common cold corona cold causing coronaviruses. Um, and there are three viruses in recent years in the coronavirus family that cause severe disease. Actually, one of the common cold coronaviruses called OC43 may have been the etiology of what was called the Russian flu in 1889, but then it settled in after immunity and having less virulence with variation into a common cold causing coronavirus. So what about SARS, the original one? That was in 2002, 2003. This was a virus that was a coronavirus that was identified as a new coronavirus that caused severe disease. It was quite a limited pandemic compared to this one, 8,100 cases around the world, 774 deaths, so really showing that high fatality rate, only 29 cases in the U.S., and it went through the horseshoe bat, then came to the palm civet and entered humans that way. The second time that we saw a coronavirus causing severe disease in this century was MERS, and that was MERS-CoV, which caused um, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Now, this all of these cases have been linked in some way to the Middle East. It is still occurring at a very low level. There was one case in 2023, again, a high fatality rate, but low number of cases, 2604 cases, 936 deaths, and the intermediary from the horseshoe bat seemed to be the dromedary or camel into humans. What about SARS-CoV-2? Well, SARS-CoV-2 was first described in uh, New Year's Eve on December 31st, 2019 to the World Health Organization. And it was that uh, point at which the um, WHO by January 7th had actually found that it was a uh, new coronavirus that hadn't been seen before. The global health emergency was declared on January 30th, 2020. By February 11th, the disease of COVID-19 was named from SARS-CoV-2. The um, pan the pandemic declaration occurred on March 11th, 2020. And then by December 11th, 2020, we had the first effective emergency use authorization for a safe and effective vaccine here in the United States, which was an mRNA vaccine made by Pfizer. Unfortunately, because of many reasons, there's still been over 7 million deaths from COVID-19 and many also collateral deaths from the pandemic response. By May 5th, 2023, the WHO declared the global health emergency over, but unfortunately, COVID-19 is not over, just the pandemic phase of the virus. So when did the vaccines come about and what about the variants for COVID-19? Well, actually, there are eight vaccines that are approved on the WHO list of vaccines that are effective against COVID-19. They are the Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Novavax, Sinopharm, Sinovac, and Covaxin vaccine. The Sputnik V has not been declared um, on the WHO list of vaccines. Now, you can see the top six of these vaccines on this slide are all RNA or DNA or other spike protein vaccines, which I'll explain in a minute. And the top bottoms, uh, sorry, the bottom three, Sinopharm, Sinovac, and Covaxin are all whole inactivated virus vaccines. So in terms of those top six, they all involve the spike protein in some way. The spike protein is this piece of the virus that sticks out and binds to the host cell or the human cell. And the two... Um, vaccines that were most prominently used in the United States were the RNA vaccines found in the bottom right. These were the Pfizer and Moderna products. mRNA vaccines actually were um, the mRNA that coded for the spike protein, K2 
can be modified as variants emerge, then the body makes the mRNA into DNA and then, um, uh, sorry, excuse me, the mRNA is translated into protein and then the spike protein, there's an immune response raised against that. The top, the Sputnik V, the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines were all DNA vaccines. The DNA goes into the body, it's made into mRNA, it's then translated into protein and that spike protein, there's an immune response raised against it. And then on the bottom left, the Novavax vaccine is a more traditional vaccine. It's the actual spike protein linked with a protein adjuvant um, and that uh, Novavax is available in the United States. Now, the vaccines did raise strong cellular mediated immunity. That really means T cell and B cell immunity. In fact, T cells are the major immune defense against viruses. And um, there was very good data from the beginning, even in the phase one studies of these vaccines, that strong T cell responses were raised with these vaccines. Also, B cell responses were raised with the vaccines. B cells, when stimulated, can produce new antibodies. But what happened over time is that the antibody response to the vaccines did fade over time, which is what we see with vaccines. And as the variants emerged, the antibodies didn't work as well, meaning that the vaccines really are there to prevent against severe disease and death, but they increasingly over time did not prevent all infections with COVID-19. This is an example in column four of this table that you can see that strong T cell responses were raised by all the vaccines in their original phase one studies. And in fact, that strong T cell response that you can see in column four here is what led the original clinical trials to show very strong protection from the COVID-19 vaccines against hospitalizations and deaths, the severe manifestations of SARS-CoV-2, certainly not all infections. And then the three whole virus vaccines that are not available in the United States, Covaxin is an Indian product, Sinovac and Sinopharm are made in China. Those whole virus vaccines also raise strong T cell responses. So the T cells and the B cells, which are cellular mediated immunity raised by these vaccines, did hold up very well, even as the variants emerged and continue to emerge with SARS-CoV-2. There's some very nice papers, immunologic immune papers over the years that showed very strong responses, T cell responses from alpha to Omicron, even as the variants emerged, that these T cell responses were preserved and thus the protection against severe disease was preserved for the majority of individuals. Memory B cells are the cells that are raised by the vaccines, and they actually produce antibodies when stimulated to do so, but it will take a while to produce those antibodies, which is why infection is not completely protected against by the current intramuscular forms of the vaccines. However, memory B cells will produce antibodies eventually directed against the variants that they see. So what about the variants with SARS-CoV-2? There was the original ancestral strain. Then there was mutation of that ancestral strain in the summer of 2020. And then the WHO started naming the variants actually according to the letters of the Greek alphabet. So the alpha variant emerged in essentially the winter of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. That's the alpha variant spread all over the world. The beta and gamma variants were not very transmissible and stayed essentially restricted to the areas in which they were found. And then the Delta variant, which emerged in the uh, spring of 2021, did was very transmissible and also spread all over the world, including very high rates of Delta variant infection in July of 2021 in the United States. The Omicron variant, which emerged on 11-26-2021, or at least that was the day that it was described from South Africa, seemed to be different from the other variants in that it was less virulent. It did not infect lung cells as well. It actually infected more of um, the upper respiratory tract. But even though it was less virulent, the Omicron variant was extremely transmissible. And all the subvariants that have emerged since then, and we are now in August of 2024, up to what are called the FLIRT variants, or KP1, KP2, and KP3, they are all part of the Omicron family original variant. This um, very transmissible but less virulent variant did seem to cause a lot of immunity worldwide because the majority of people worldwide were infected with the Omicron variant. And in fact, by November 2022, 99.99% of individuals in the United States had anti-spike antibody. That meant they'd either seen the vaccine 
or the virus, and 90% had anti-nucleic uh, uh, capsid antibodies, which of course represent natural infection, not the vaccine, because those are spike protein vaccines. So a lot of natural immunity occurred from the Omicron variant worldwide. That's really what led to the declaration of the end of the pandemic. The United States ended their health emergency on May 11th, 2023 from COVID-19, and the WHO entered ended the phase of the global health emergency on May 5th, 2023. This was really after all the mortality from COVID-19 with these subsequent waves of infection that you can see here. And finally, with the lower rates of mortality is when the WHO declared the end of the pandemic. This spike that you can see at the beginning of 2023 really represented what happened in China. China had a very strong lockdown response to COVID-19, but uh, due to protests from their um, from their populace, population, uh, they did open quite abruptly uh, in uh, the early 2023. That led to this spike of mortality, unfortunately, um, especially among those who are older, who had not received the third dose or the booster dose of the vaccine. So all of that meant that the World Health Organization waited until spring of 2023 to end the global emergency phase of the pandemic. However, it does not mean that COVID-19 is over. And in fact, COVID-19 will always be with us. Uh, the WHO has adopted a strategy that because of that, uh, they really looked to the data to see who they would recommend uh, booster doses for of the vaccine. And this very large study in The Lancet from the UK response of 30 million people who were vaccinated with two shots showed that the individuals who are still at risk for severe infection, even after two shots of the vaccine, were those over 80, those who were on immunosuppressants, or those who had five or more comorbidities. So the World Health Organization does recommend yearly booster shots for those three groups, older people, those on immunosuppressants, and those with multiple comorbidities. And the majority of nations around the world are following suit, recommending booster shots on first principles, really just of those who are still at risk for severe disease on a yearly basis or during surges with new variants and increased transmissibility. The WHO had actually laid out that plan in March of 2022 before they declared the end of the pandemic on May 5th, 2023. And what they did is come up with three scenarios. One is the base scenario, which is where we are now. We're still in the Omicron phase of the variants so that we would vaccinate vulnerable groups every surge or winter. The best case scenario is if a new variant emerges that's less virulent, that would give everyone more immunity. And the worst case scenario is a more virulent variant emerges. And in that case, there will be booster shots recommended for everyone who qualifies for vaccines. Now, um, the thing about the vaccines is that they were wonderful in terms of protecting against severe disease and death, but they did not raise mucosal immunity in the nasal mucosa, and they did not uh, prevent all infections, especially after the alpha variant phase had passed. So really, it was hybrid immunity, which natural infection raises the mucosal antibodies, the vaccine raises the T and B cells, and it's the combination of both forms of infection, natural infection and vaccine-induced simulation of infection that cause the strongest and most durable type of immunity. There is certainly um, right now ongoing efforts to develop nasal mucosal uh, IgA-generating vaccines. So where are we now in the pandemic? This is really around the concept of endemicity. So in any pathogen, there are four levels of control that we try to reach. One is control. Most um, pathogens are under control, but that reduces it, unfortunately, only to an acceptable level. To get to elimination, where you eliminate a virus in a certain region, or eradication, where you permanently reduce the incidence of the pathogen worldwide, is very difficult to achieve. And in fact, there's only one human virus that's ever been eradicated. That is the smallpox virus, because it had four features that SARS-CoV-2 does not, and most pathogens do not. One is that smallpox had no animal reservoirs, Second is that smallpox only looked like itself. It had very clear pathogenic features. Third is that smallpox had a very short period of infectiousness. And fourth, either getting infected or getting the vaccine with smallpox caught sterilizing lifelong immunity. COVID-19 has neither of those features. There's many animal reservoirs. It can spread when asymptomatic. 
It's found, um, uh, it looks like many other respiratory illnesses, its manifestations, and our vaccines are very good against protecting against severe disease, but do not provide sterilizing immunity. So in that state of endemicity, we really do need both vaccines and also treatments, because if you cannot get rid of a virus, it is very helpful for those who are still at risk for severe disease to have antiviral treatments. And really, there are, the, besides the inpatient treatment for severe disease, there are two available oral agents for SARS-CoV-2. One is Paxlovid, which had originally been studied among unvaccinated individuals and showed a very high protection against hospitalization and death. In the era of widespread vaccination and or natural immunity, actually Paxlovid seems to be most important for those who continue to be at risk for severe disease. Again, those who are older on immunosuppressants and those with multiple comorbidities. And that are those are the groups that the FDA recommends ongoing Paxlovid use for. In terms of persisting symptoms with COVID, we have seen persistent symptoms with chronic infections ever since actually likely um, the 1918 influenza pandemic with a described syndrome of encephalitis lethargica or fatigue following that viral infection. Fatigue follows many viral infections and um, and COVID-19 is no exception. However, COVID-19, the rate of having persisting symptoms does seem to correlate with the severity of disease, which is why um, protection, protecting individuals against severe disease with ongoing booster vaccinations and antiviral treatments if they're at risk is very important in COVID-19. So we are now in a phase of the pandemic where we need ongoing booster vaccines, but we also need vaccinations for other infectious diseases. And really vaccines are the mainstay for any pathogen, those at risk need vaccines. They want vaccines. People are taking the booster vaccines if they're at risk. So targeting our booster campaign against those who are at risk is very important to do. And um, I did write a uh, book for Mayo Clinic Press on the COVID-19 pandemic. It was called Endemic, uh, published uh, uh, last year. And I proposed a 10-step plan uh, for the management of pandemics, including SARS-CoV-2, one step is always to accelerate vaccines, and once the vaccine is out, to ease restrictions accordingly, which will give people more faith in the vaccines to ease masking and other restrictions. The third is to emphasize a more harm reduction approach in education, as opposed to a more coercive approach, which never really works in pandemics. Any respiratory virus, we should be encouraging outside activities as opposed to inside where viruses can spread more quickly. Schools are a very special case. They're very important for children. So we want to reopen schools as quickly as possible in the setting of a pandemic, not use blunt lockdowns, but more focused protection for those who are at risk. We want to de-emphasize anything that is ineffective, like deep cleaning. And we definitely want to reassess testing as the pandemic goes along and we get vaccines. Antiviral treatments are extremely important for the management of any chronic pathogen that will not be eradicated because of its properties. And then we're in the phase of preparing for future pandemics, which really means a lot about trust. Vaccine hesitancy is on the rise after COVID. We want to really combat misinformation on vaccines, but also increase trust in public health by clear, transparent, and nuanced messaging. And um, we also uh, have to do what it takes to increase trust in the public health establishment. So thank you very much for your attention on this talk on COVID-19.